Daryl Brooks, Circular Conversations. Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, continuing to examine various excerpts of Daryl Brooks's trial to educate you about narcissism. Here, we're going to look at the circular conversation. The circular conversation is a common manipulation used by narcissists, and it can often be particularly infuriating and soul-destroying for the victim to be engaged in. Circular conversations occur because of two things, fuel and threat to control. Invariably, when you are speaking with the narcissist, you are going to be giving the narcissist fuel, and lots of it, where you are talking physically proximate to the narcissist. The words you are using, the tone of those words, the look in your eyes, your body language and facial expressions are all going to provide lots of fuel to that narcissist, so there isn't an issue. This fuel powers the narcissist, allows the narcissist to keep going. Of course, where you're arguing with the narcissist, debating with the narcissist, pointing out the narcissist done something wrong, criticizing what the narcissist has said, rubbishing the observations of the narcissist, you're repeatedly challenging the narcissist and the threatening control, and therefore the narcissist cannot allow that to be the case. The narcissist, of course, has three methods of asserting control, directly, indirectly, or by withdrawal. So in some instances, if the narcissist finds that they are unable by direct discussion with you to get you to back down, they could turn to somebody else and say, have you heard the nonsense that this person's spouting? That will give them momentary control because the friend, often a member of the coach, will go, yeah, if she doesn't know what she's talking about. The problem is, of course, the victim is still there and they will continue to criticize. So the control is gained, but then immediately lost thereafter or challenged again. And therefore, in such instances as where the victim keeps going, the indirect assertion of control is not useful. Of course, the narcissist may well withdraw, basically saying, I haven't got time for this Mickey Mouse bullshit, and walking away from the conversation, or perhaps even simply sitting down, arms folded, staring ahead and not saying anything. Even if the victim continues to go on, jabbing them with the finger, the narcissist might just sit there sulking in their head, thinking, you're an idiot, I'm not listening to you and thus gaining the assertion of control. But often what happens is that the narcissist will go on and on and on as the narcissism is enjoying, in effect, the provision of the fuel which is allowing this narcissist just to keep going and 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 going until essentially it's a war of attrition so that you are worn down. The narcissist is fueled. You get to the end of your tether you're fed up, you lose the will to live, and you say, oh, forget it, you're right. And thus you've ceded control to the narcissist, and the narcissist has gained the control, as well as having been very well fueled by you. With Daryl Brooks, that's what his narcissism is seeking to do, essentially to grind the judge into admission that she's wrong and he's right. It isn't a conscious tactic that he's engaging in, no siree. It's simply a product of his narcissism, which is causing him to believe, one, he's right, two, the judge is wrong, and three, that the judge effectively is a big meanie that's engaging in judicial misconduct and isn't being fair to him. I'm now going to play the footage to you, which goes on for quite a while, and then I'll dissect it for you. You will see a circular conversation in action. You'll see the way that the judge addresses it, and finally resolves the issue, which he's only able to do of of as a consequence of the fact that she wields judicial power. And also, you can see the impact that it has upon her. Watch her body language. Here comes the footage. Uh, I will take these in order. Uh, the first uh, is a note from Mr. Brooks that was handed to... Deputy Wittig at about 12.05, it says, I would like my filings addressed, parenthesis, notice of special appearance, statement of particulars, both are, both are by affidavit, file 10.322, which today is deadline to respond. Thank you, um, Mr. Brooks. I'm respectfully declining to respond to those filings. That's my decision, sir. Next. Are you making a judicial determination that those have no merit? Mr. Brooks, I have indicated to you on the record what I will or will not do. I would like to motion for a finding of fact. Your request is denied. 
The next, May your honor explain why Mr. Brooks, I'm going to go through these one by one. If I feel the need to make more of a record, I will do so. The record will be available later on. If you think I've made an error, you can then raise that on appeal. I know you're making the error, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to have a debate with you right now. We I'm are not. continuing on. I'm giving you the courtesy to respond to each one of these things. That's how I've responded. I expect that you will, even if you disagree with my decision, sir, that you will respect it and we'll move forward. The next piece of paper filed at 1.52 p.m. Like says, a are you making a judicial determination? I'm not allowed my right under the First Amendment to freedom of speech in this courtroom. Um, Mr. Brooks, um, we have rules of decorum and courtesy. They have been provided to you multiple times. They are part of the materials that you have before you. Do they fall under the First Amendment? SCR Chapter 62 discusses just the standards of courtesy and decorum for the courts of Wisconsin. In addition, sir, parties are able to file requests with the court. It's called a motion. A motion, however, is based in law there is a citation to not only that law, but relevant facts, and there's a request for relief. While you have the right to present a defense, you do not have a right to disrupt the proceedings. That was not direct, uh, uh, and disruption. Mr. I was, Brooks. I was asking, will my First Amendment right, which is freedom to freedom of speech, and a right to be heard in court, will that be honored by your honor? That's a valid question. Mr. Brooks, that's a constitutional I right. have given you ample opportunity to present information, evidence, to question when we've had witnesses on the stand, but I expect you to follow the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence when presenting your requests. I can't even so, get these admitted into evidence. That's Mr. Brooks, I cannot explain to you if you don't understand the basis in law for the denial. You're right. I don't understand. But, so, I, I but following, that doesn't mean we're going to have a discussion no, or a I'm debate about debate you, what it means because we're not going to do that. The rules that you said so the bottom line is I don't feel, Mr. Brooks, stop talking. I do no, not I was feel. Right, I was following the rules when you said that I had to make all and objections And you did, and I'm going through them, writing. so let me. Give me the courtesy of replying or responding to these. And please give me the courtesy that even when you disagree with how I answer them, that you will not interrupt me. It's not about me trying to interrupt you, Your Honor. Mr. Brooks, All I'm, saying let, is, I'm going to address the next one, so you, please pay attention. What you were saying about decorum, I was asking, does that fall under the First Amendment? Because the First Amendment, which is my constitutional right, says that I have the right to freedom of speech and to be heard in this court. Mr. That's Brooks, all again, you have the right to present a defense, and but that right is not unfettered. But that's that right, Mr. I'm Brooks, you are interrupting me. Stop. Because you're talking about no, because you're, you're purposely about doing, doing this, when, so I can't get my reasoning out. You make it incredibly difficult. Amendment. I'm not refer referring to the Sixth Amendment, Mr. I'm referring Brooks, to the First Amendment which clearly says that I have the right to freedom of speech and to be heard in the courtroom. Are, are you not going to honor my constitutional right, Your Honor? If not, that is judicial misconduct, and you're making a judicial determination to not honor my constitutional right. I just want to be treated fairly, like anyone else, which you said on the record that you will be fair and impartial. Mr. Brooks, you also have an obligation to treat this court fairly, and you have an obligation to follow the rules of courtesy and decorum, the rules of procedure, the rules of evidence. Your Honor, that, I that's not, the playing field that you willingly entered into and made a deliberate decision not. to waive your right to an attorney can, and to appear in this it, case as your own attorney. I can to represent myself pro per. The same, the same paperwork that you gave me, you have, and I also have a copy of the same one where I scratched out what I did not agree or consent to. We both know that, Your Honor. 
All Mr. Brooks, simply, I made findings months. regarding that, and those findings stand that despite you scratching out uh, some of those words on but, there, I made you, very specific findings about uh, your waiver of right to an attorney. So we're not going to relitigate that also, here right now. You also now. accepted the, the, the terms of the paperwork that I Mr. filed Mr. Brooks, out. I'm not going to engage with you about whether you and I have entered into some type of a contract. We, we did not. Or engage we in any type in, of, of that kind of dialogue. Because that's what you're claiming through some no, of these not, filings, and you've said that. that previously. I am not claiming that, Your Honor. So, in any way, Mr. Brooks, form, I do, I'm do giving you some leeway. Contract. You continue to talk over me. It's... Uh, you please, I'm asking you to follow the rules of civility. Simple rule, sir. Don't interrupt me. Did I did I not just let you read the whole jury instructions and follow the rules that you said I have to write down? You did. Anything that I object to and then hand it in. Except now I'm that we're discussing them, it seems to me that the rules don't quite matter to you, sir. No, that, that is not what, what's so being asserted on Here's what's end. happening, sir. I'm, all I'm telling you, all I'm, I'm advising you. To respect the rules, I'm advising you that if you continue to interrupt, you risk forfeiting your right to be present in this courtroom. Are you? Because I still need to continue with these proceedings, sir. I need to go through all of the documents that you filed, and you're not letting me do that. Because we didn't so get I'm gonna. The if issue. I need to, it's, I'll remove you to the other courtroom so that I can do this. this is, and yes, exercise the mute button, sir. This, this but is, and this then I'll bring you back filed, on the though. jury's back. This was filed, though, Your Honor, and it's a valid. He, Mr. Brooks is clearly valid. not uh, following the simple rule of civility that I have established. That's he continues to Honor. interrupt. I'm, He's not. Uh, providing this court with ability Honor. to make rulings on the record without interruption. So this is your final warning, or you will be removed to the other courtroom. Will your honor honor my First Amendment right? I'm or not answering that it, question, sir, because I've already addressed it. So you're making a judicial determination to deprive me of my constitutional right? I am not right. making any such determination, sir. So you just said you're not going to answer the question about my First Amendment right, which says Sir, that I've I already have answered the question that... You have a right to present a defense. That is the You have a amendment, right to be present. First. You're trying to twist you up the amendments. You have a right to present your defense, but your rights are not unfettered. Yes, they your are, rights, Your Honor. You're citing the Sixth Amendment, which I am not Mr. Brooks, questioning. Your I'm, First Amendment, in some respects, is circumscribed by the rules of evidence and the rules of procedure. Does it say that I have? So it doesn't mean you get to say anything that you want in no, front I'm, of a jury. Honor, it doesn't mean you get to put forth any kind of evidence that you want in front Honor, of a jury. I, I what being, it means, sir, is that you must am follow. I you yes, you're your being name? disrespectful because you're I'm not, not doing anything of the sort. All right, I he is continuously talking over me, so. At this point, I'm going to find that he's forfeited his right to be present I as I go through right, his, I have not consented to any, I'm his paperwork. To he's to be removed to the other courtroom until such time as he can pledge to follow the rules of decorum the and civility. About we'll be in recess amendment. until we have everything Your Honor, set I do not up. agree to it. Uh, the record to reflect, I'm stepping off. The now, well done an enduring... Brooks's circular conversation, but let's break it down for you. The judge is addressing certain filings that have been made by him, and he comments that he st states in it that he wants his filings addressed, and the judge declines. Uh, declining to do so is challenge fuel to him. She's responding to him, thus giving him fuel, but threatening his control by not giving him what he wants. That, of course, will not sit with him, and therefore his narcissism compels him to become argumentative. And he states, are you making a judicial determination that these have no merit? The judge explains, I have made it clear what I will or will not do. Of course, his narcissism will not let him take that sitting down or even standing up. And he states, I would like to motion for a finding of fact. You notice that in representing himself, Brooks thinks he's far cleverer than he is. He's evidently an individual of low cognitive function, but his narcissism deludes him into believing him that he's better than any other attorney that could be found, and that he knows the law, and that this judge doesn't know what she's doing. 
Of course, a very simple comparison of the evidence, and I don't mean the evidence in the case, but the evidence is this. The lady that sat opposite, Judge Jennifer, she has clearly studied the law. And I'm not familiar with how judges are trained in the United States, but if it was in the United Kingdom, that judge will have been either a solicitor or a barrister for a set period of time, getting huge amounts of experience under their judicial belt before applying for a position and being selected. They also then receive judicial training. I imagine the situation is roughly similar in the United States. But the point is this. That judge has legal training, has legal experience, and has both of those things in spade loads. Brooks's legal experience is being hauled in front of court and convicted of various crimes. And therefore, anybody looking at it would say, she's got the legal ability, he hasn't. But in his deluded world, he believes he's the one that's cleverer than her. The judge denies his request for a motion for a finding of fact. So he then states, may your honour explain why it's denied. He will not let it go. The judge explains, Mr Brooks, I'm going to go through these one by one. If I feel the need to make more of a record, I will do so. The record will be available later on. If you think I've made an error, you can appeal. She explains the process to him politely and courteously. He immediately jumps in, showing his arrogance and know-it-all attitude. I know you're making an error, your honour. Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to have a debate with you. Note during this exchange the fixed stare that he engages in as his narcissism seeks to intimidate the judge. He then attempts to talk over the judge, exhibiting his lack of boundary recognition, his sense of entitlement, a lack of accountability for his behaviour, and a lack of emotional empathy for the judge with regard to going on and on. The judge explains that the rules of decorum have been provided to Brooks many times and that he's allowed to put a defence in, but he has no right to disrupt the proceedings. He then denies this. There wasn't a disruption. I was asking why my First Amendment rights, which is the freedom of speech, will that be honoured? The judge explains that she's given him ample opportunity and that she expects for him to follow the rules. He then explains, I don't understand. I'm not trying to debate you, even though that's precisely what he is doing, hypocrisy. He continues to talk over her. She tells him, Mr Brooks, stop talking. He then says, no, I was following the rules. He is clearly defiant. Give me the courtesy of not interrupting, explains the judge. It's not about me trying to interrupt you. All I'm saying, and he goes on referring again to the First Amendment. The judge repeats the, the reasoning with regard to him being allowed to put forward a defence. I'm talking about the First Amendment, he says. You're interrupting me, the judge points out. Because you're talking about, he starts and continues to argue again bringing up his fascination with the First Amendment. You can see at this point that the judge's body language shows that she's starting to lose the will to live, dealing with this intransigent individual. He maintains, are you not going to honour my constitutional right? If not, that's judicial misconduct. I just wanted to be treated fairly. You said you'd be fair. Notice how his victim mentality comes shining through at this juncture. You're not being fair to me. You said you'd be fair. Of course, he's utterly incapable of seeing that he's being a complete bell end in his behaviour. But his narcissism compels him to believe the judge is the troublemaker here. She's not being fair to me. She said she'd be fair and now she's not. That's not fair, is it? The judge explains that she'd already made findings about his waiver of the right to an attorney. She's not going to relitigate that. But he continues to argue, trying to talk over the judge, again demonstrating his absence of boundary recognition and his sense of entitlement. The judge chastises him, saying, don't interrupt me. And then says, did I not just let you read the whole jury instructions? He's trying to give evidence of them being compliant and that I had to write things down. The judge explains, we are discussing it. It would seem, however, the rules don't quite matter to you. She certainly gets that right. And they don't. They are, he thinks he complies with the rules, but his conduct and behaviour doesn't. As always, the narcissist will say that they behave when their behaviour shows that they do not. 
The judge explains that she needs to go through all the documents that he's filed and that he is not letting her. Notice here, again, that collateral consequence of the narcissist's behavior. By continuing to have this circular conversation appertaining to him being able to exercise his First Amendment rights and her addressing that, he's failing to have his other filings addressed. He's wasting his own time. This is typical of lesser and mid-range narcissists that they will focus in the moment on a particular point which is actually to their detriment. The judge explains that if he keeps up this behaviour she'll remove him to the other court. She then makes the point for the record that Mr Brooks is not following the rules of civility. He continues to interrupt and gives him a final warning with regard to his conduct. He, notwithstanding this warning, which has no effect upon him other than to be challenge fuel, comes back to, yes, you've guessed it, the First Amendment. He continues to talk over the judge. He continues to interrupt her as his narcissism compels him to seek to nullify the threat to control posed by her failing to address his questions about the First Amendment. He then argues that he hasn't consented to the forfeiture of his rights to be in the courtroom, again, failing to realise that it's his own behaviour that has put him here, and then the judge then says that he'll be removed to the other courtroom and the bailiffs start to crank up into action. At that point, the judge leaves. Sensible action on her part to no longer engage in the conversation with him, but to remove herself from him, a sensible way of dealing with a narcissist of his nature. Now, of course, she can't keep doing that because she has a trial to preside over. But this interaction demonstrates to you the obsessiveness of Brooks in addressing this issue about the First Amendment and should demonstrate to you that it's pointless to continue to argue with the narcissist because all you're doing is giving the narcissist fuel and they'll go round and round and round until either you give up or, if you won't, they will invariably back away. Brooks wasn't going to go back away here. He was just going to keep going and going and going. Here, of course, the judge could deal with him through the exercise of her judicial powers by having him removed to the other courtroom and then walking away herself. You, of course, don't have such a power to compel the narcissist to be put in another room, but you do have the power to walk away yourself. You should recognise that trying to debate and argue with the narcissist is utterly pointless. And the best thing that you can do, if you really need to say something, is you state your position once, so it's a matter of record, for you, and perhaps if there are other people listening, and then you remove yourself, because you're never going to persuade the narcissist to see your point of view if the narcissism dictates that that's not appropriate. I'm H.G. Tudor. Thank you for watching.